Hello and welcome to this lecture. Today we will talk about two very common server services, DNS and DHCP. Uh, so these are the two topics of today. Um, there are quite a lot to cover uh, when talking about DNS. I think most of you know what DNS is. Uh, you use it every day. Um, but there are quite a lot of uh, things under the hood, how it works, that I think you should know. So, DNS, uh, in its bare essence, it uh, creates user-friendly name for IP addresses. That is the, the basics of it. Uh, you can uh, connect an IP address to a name both these visits a server or a client or some service. Uh, we have three different use cases. You only see two here, but they're quite different. You can use it for public. That's the way you use it every day when you're trying to look up an address for a web server or a mail server. Uh, or you can use it for internal use. Uh, you can also have it integrated with Active Directory, but we won't go through that today. We will talk about Active Directory later on in this course, so I won't cover that use case. Uh, here you see a typical forward lookup. We have a client over here. Um, it wants to know the address for www.lnu.se. Uh, and it has a DNS server con uh, configured. Uh, so it will ask that DNS server, do you have the address for this domain, domain name? If it does, it will send a, a reply to the client with that address. This is the bare essence. This is called a forward lookup. So DNS is a tree-like structure. As you may have known, uh, we have a, a top, which usually is called the root. Uh, under that, we have some names like uh, com, not com, com, or se for Swedish, and uh, maybe net. Under these, we have other names like um, LNU. So this is the, the tree that you have, LNU.se, and then you actually have a dot in the end also, which you don't use that much, but the DNS uh, server use that. So that is the, the, the tree structure. It can go on for quite a while. It has some limitations. Uh, each node can't be longer than 63 characters. You have a maximum depth of 127 uh, levels. And the depth, I mean, uh, is, oh, sorry. Like this. So this is layer 1, 2, 3, 4. And you can't have more than 127 of these layers. Uh, but the total domain name can't be longer than 255 characters, if you include the whole name. Uh, in reality, it's 253. They use the last two characters for something. So uh, you shouldn't exceed 253 characters. At the same level, or Children can't have the same name under one parent. They have to be unique. So that's the, the basics uh, about the limitations. We have some terminology that's good to know when talking about DNS. Uh, this I talked about is called 
the root is always uh, commonly just the dot as you see in the top. Uh, then you have the TLDs, are these usually called the top level domains. They are quite a lot of uh, different nowadays. Uh, then you have something called an FQDN. Maybe you're not familiar with that, but that is the fully qualified domain name. So for this node here, the CS node, the fully qualified domain name for that node is cs.lnu.se. Dot, actually, in the end also. And then we have domains. And in this tree, we have a lot of domains, actually. We have the, the SE domain, which is all of these. Uh, we have a LNU domain that's in this circle. We have a CS domain within that circle. So you can have a lot of different domains in, a, in, a, in the tree structure. A host is at the very end of the, it's usually a, a service or a computer or something like that at the bottom. And then we have subdomains and that's just domains under one domain. So CS is a uh, subdomain for LNU. We have some other terminology that we will explain later on. So back to the top level domains. From the beginning, these were the ones the com, the edu, the gov, the mil, net, org, and int. Uh, they have a, had a specific purpose when they launched these. Uh, but the, uh, it's been, the area has been quite grayed out nowadays. Uh, the net was used for network services, but nowadays we use it for almost anything. Um, I think there are some restrictions still on some of those. Like gov, you have to be a government to use a .gov top domain. Uh, and I think EDU also has some uh, requirements for be able to register for that domain, for the domain name under that top domain. So as of today, uh, at least at January, we have 1,205 top level domain names. And as you can realize, under these are millions and millions of domains. So we can't have a system where we rely on just a couple of servers having all those information. It will become very slow if we had. So DNS is uh, built for being a decentralized administration. And they use something called delegations. So when we buy or get an address under the SE domain, we register it that we want to, to buy this name, LNU. And when we do that, they will delegate the control to one of our DNS servers, name servers, I should say. DNS is the, the name for the whole system, domain name system. Uh, you don't say DNS server, you say name server. Um, and then we can administer the different nodes and hosts and subdomains under our domain name. So we own that and can do what we want with it. We can even make our own delegations. We can have a department that have a lot of hosts and they want to be manager of those hosts. So you can delegate control to another DNS server in the, within the organization. So it could look something like this. We usually uh, make these red lines when we want to symbolize a delegation. And by that, the, the SC uh, name servers doesn't know 
anything under the one specific delegation. It only knows which name server knows more about that zone. So if you ask SE for uh, something under CS, it will only hand you off to the LNU name server. And these are called zones. So a zone and a domain isn't the same thing. We have the domain, LNU, here. But the zone for LNU is just this one, because we have delegated control for the different zones. And then we have the name servers. These are the, the server application that handles the zones. So it will load a file with information about the zone, uh, or it can actually get the, f the zone file from another server. Um, these name servers are responsible for the zone. One name server could have multiple zones. They usually do. Um, and you can run the zone in different modes. You can have a primary master, which has read and write access to the entire zone file. And then you have secondary masters, which can't edit anything in the zone file. It has has to contact the primary master to make changes. The secondary will load the zone file from the primary or secondary. Uh, when the secondary name server start up, it will contact the, the master or another secondary and see if changes has been done. If it has, it will collect those changes, and that's called a zone transfer. We have two different type of lookup zones. You saw the, the, the first one before I, I showed you, uh, forward lookup. That's when you have a name and want an IP address. And we have different resource records for the forward lookup. These are not all of them. There are quite a lot more resource records type, but these are the ones that we usually work with. Then we have the reverse lookup zone, and that's when you have an IP address and once a domain name, or FQDN. And those records are called uh, pointers, or PTRs, records. Uh, you usually don't use that as must, um, uh, much. Uh, so look into some of these resource records. We have the A record, resource for address record. Uh, I put together the, the A and the AAAA record, which is for IPv6 addresses. So they are different between uh, IPv4 and IPv6. And this is the most commonly used, I think, uh, so you just connect the name with an IP address. Then we have the C name, the canonical name. And then when you have an alias for uh, another. So you can say if you have a, a web server, a physical web server who has one uh, name. And then you have multiple websites running on that server. Uh, so if that server changes it, its name, you don't want to change all the, uh, changes its IP address. You don't want to ch change all the records for the different domains that are connected to that one. So you use a C name instead. So we have a C name here or, uh, from www.lnu.se that points to the address lnu.se. 
And then we have an A record probably for lnu.se who are pointing to an IP address. Then maybe we have uh, cs.lnu.se that also we want to go to the same web server. And if we want to change the IP address for the server, then we just have to change the lnu.se A record and it will change for all. It will not, if you used it in a browser and you type www.lnu.se, it won't change the name in the browser to lnu.se. It doesn't do any transfers or something. This is, run, this is uh, done under the hood and you don't see it. It's done by the resolver, which I will talk about later. And then you have the name server records. These are ident for identifying which are the name servers for this domain. We usually have at least two name servers for each, each zone. And that's uh, because of failure. If one server goes down, we still can connect a secondary or another server to get the, the records that we want. And for, for big domains, we have a lot of uh, name servers who are connected. And then you can put a lot of them there. And it's used for the, the delegation also. So under the, if we say we have a zone file for uh, lnu.se, uh, and then we want another server to handle the cs.lnu.se, then we use the name server to point out which is the name server you should go to if you want more information about that domain. Then we have a very <coughs> important record type. It's called a SOA, Start of Authority. Uh, you have to have one of these records, and you can only have one in each zone. Uh, it points out the start of the, which name server has the best information, usually the, one of the primary masters. Uh, it also has records or uh, information about uh, if you need to email a domain administrator, they should have that in that record also. That's not controlled by any uh, official party, so you can put anything in there. So um, maybe that's not so useful uh, in the real world. But it's still a part of the, the startup authority record. Then you have a domain serial number. Uh, that is actually for the other domain or name servers who wants to get an update for that. They have also this record and will check if their serial number is the same as the master. If it isn't, it will make its own transfer to get the new updates. So as soon as you change something, uh, add a new record or change an IP address of an A record, then you will also update the serial number so that the secondary masters can update their files. We also have some information about refreshing and time to live and stuff like that in this record. Then we have the MX record. Uh, let's say we wanted to send an email. Um, at lnu.se. If my mail server that I'm delivering this message to, I want to send an email to this address. Then okay, we have a domain here. We have lnu.se. Then you think, okay, when we have to send the email to, we look up the lnu.se. Uh, what that has for an IP address, and then send an email to that server. But that so server probably will be a web server, because you want to go to that web page if you type lnu.se. So we have this record to help out and uh, point out which is the mail server for this domain. So the mail server will ask a special question. It will always <coughs> ask a question about the MX record when it wants to send an email. And if you ask for the MX record for lnu.se, you will get the name of the mail server. 
you also have a priority. You can have a lot of different mail servers. And then you have this priority. You can make uh, 10, 20, 30 um, in which you want uh, how much load you want to get to the different mail servers. Then we have the pointer record, which is for the reverse lookup. So here we have an IP address that's translated into a domain name. And that you have to think about that a bit, because <coughs> if this is a web server and you are hosting a lot of different domains on that web server, it will still have one IP address, but a lot of different domain names. So which one should you choose for the pointer record? You have to think about what, which one. Or you may be not choosing any of those. You just, OK, this is mail server 23 in our organization. Doesn't matter which domain names are, it, it actually serves. Then we have TXT record, which stands for text record. It was originally used for putting information for us humans to read. But today, it's usually for other type of machine-to-machine -machine information exchange. Uh, so these are, if you type in, I want a text record for lnu.se, you get this one. And I don't think that's so humanable readable. <laughs> but uh, that's for mail spam filter to work, actually. Uh, we don't have to go to what the SPF is in this course. Uh, but as I said, these are just some of the record types that uh, are in DNS. If you want to look them up, I just search for DNS resource record type and then you get a full list. It all depends on the client part, uh, on what, you, what they are looking for. So you can probably make up your own uh, and use it in your application if you wanted to. Uh, but I think most of them, if you want to use it in your application, most of them have been doing that in a, a TXT record to provide some information about the domain. Here we have an example of a zone file. It's sad to say it's not a standard. Each DNS or name server has their own, but they usually look quite alike, but not exactly. Uh, so what can we get out of this zone file? We have the domain it's concerning. This is example.org. The first one is a uh, start of authority record. It will point out the server that knows best about the domain. It's uh, ns1.example.org. Uh, then we have a special format for the email address for the responsible person of the domain. And it's, you can't use an uh, at sign in, in these records. You, have to, you can only use uh, these common characters and a dot. So we say that the first, the last dot before the domain name is the first part of the, the email address. So the email address for this one should be admin at example.org. And then we have this special record where you can see the serial number and a lot of different uh, time to live and when it expires and when it should retry. This is for secondary um, name servers. If it can't connect to the, to the master when it's boot up, it will probably use its old records, but it has an uh, expire date. So if the, it's older than, than uh, this time, this is in seconds, then it should stop serving that domain. And this is a retry, how, how often should it try to re connect to the name server? And then we have uh, time to live with that, Will I talk to uh, you about in a minute. The next part is about uh, name servers. And you don't see any, anything here. 
as you do down here. Uh, and it depends on the, on the uh, name server. In, in a Windows name server, you will see an at sign here. That's why you can't use it here. Because that sign in, in their implementation shows you that it's for the whole domain name. So the name servers for this domain is this one. So they have two different name servers. And then you have to have, since this is part of the actual zone, they will have uh, a record for the different name servers also. They also have an MX record or two. Uh, so they have two different mail servers for this domain. And then we see an, uh, an alias also. So they, they, are, they are quite readable, uh, all of these different zone files, but they are not exactly the same. So at the top, we have these root name servers. Uh, for quite a while, there have been these 13 servers. They have made some changes. That's why it states logical root name servers, because some of them use the technique so they can share the load between a lot of different physical servers. But they all have the same IP. And that sounds quite strange, because if you have the same IP, then you will have a collision. But this uses a uh, technique called any cost. Um, and they all have names. They go under the root-servers.org. And they have 13. You have changed the, the letter in, the, in this one to A, B, C, D, and so on. If you want more information, you can go to root-servers.org. Um, we have an, an organization which is responsible for this. It's a non-profitable organization called ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assign, Assigned Names and Numbers. You maybe have heard of INA uh, before, but it changed to ICANN. Uh, and some of the responsibilities are for the DNS system. They're responsible for the top level generic domain names. They have uh, divided the different top level domains in different categories. You have the general, you have the country code top level, and you have some others uh, also. They are also responsible for IP address assignment and stuff like that. Um, they do not operate themselves, all of these servers. They have different organizations that help them with this. And it distributed all over the world. Uh, from the beginning, there was only three, 13 um, servers. And we had actually one in Stockholm, uh, and still has uh, some in Stockholm uh, who are responsible for this. And all these share, have the same information, of course. They have the same information about uh, the different uh, top-level domains. And then now we have IP addresses for the name servers of the other, uh, for the top-level domain. So for uh, SE, they have a record for the different name servers uh, you can contact to get more information about the .se addresses. So as I said, they had, there were uh, 1,000 20 something top level domains. So these files will include 1,023 uh, records. And in these records, you can have a lot of different name servers for each of these top level domains. So, how will we find these root servers? If you have installed a, a name server, how will it find the top? the root. 
Well, there are two different ways. Uh, to find the roots, you usually have a root hint file. That comes installed with the, the name server, or it's downloaded when you install it. These almost never change. The IP addresses for the, the root name servers have been the same for quite some time. Uh, so that's why it's uh, OK to have this come with the installation of the name servers. Here's an example of a root hint file. It's quite long if you can't go down here. Here you see information about the A root uh, name server. And it has two IP addresses, one for IPv4 and one for IPv6. And then we have 13 of these records. So each of these only have one IP address, but it can actually be quite a lot of servers who are handling that name server. Each of these have a web page, and they are, have different organizations who are responsible for them, and they have put their information. So you can go and check uh, h.root.server.net uh, and see if, if you want. They have statistics on how much that server has been used and stuff like that. So we can't have, if we go back, <coughs> if my name server gets a question uh, about a domain, which it doesn't have a zone file for, it will forward the question to one of the root servers. Uh, you can imagine that the questions to these root servers will be quite large if we didn't have any form of caching or something like that. I forgot to tell you also that the other way to find uh, the answer, you can configure forwarders on your name server. So if my name server doesn't know the answer, it can forward the question to another name server. Uh, but we have caching. And that's, of course, because we need uh, better performance. Uh, each record has a TTL, or time to live connected to it. And that's how long the maximum time a name server can store that record. Uh, so if my name server doesn't know uh, the, this domain, it will go and ask maybe a root server, OK, do you know this address? It will say, oh, I don't maybe know exactly that one, but I know the name server that does. And then I get that answer. And Connected to that record, it's in time to live. OK, you can store this record for this top level uh, domain. It has this IP address. You can store that for, let's say, one hour. So when I later on make the same question, my server directly can connect, uh, let's say, respond that, OK, this is the one. Uh, and having a long time to live, well, of course, the, the, the pro. The pros there are that you will have great speed, and you won't exhaust all the name servers in the world so, as much. But if you wanted to change something, I wanted to change the, the IP address, or maybe I got a result that I don't know that domain name. No one does uh, as of now. But then maybe an administrator adds a record for that. Then all the servers will still say, no, no, I don't know this one because they have this time to live and it hasn't gone out. So if you put a uh, time to live for two days, it will take up to two days before new uh, clients could find that result. And of course, short TTL. The pros is that you can change your names and uh, information on your name server quite often. Uh, and it, uh, will, uh, the new uh, clients will find it. But the, the, the cons are uh, that your name server will get a lot of requests. So we talked a lot about the server part. DNS also has a client part, which is called a resolver. Uh, all uh, operating system come pre-installed with some sort of resolver so that applications can ask 
the, the system, oh, I want an address for this uh, domain name. Or I want the mail server for, for, for this domain, or something like that. So instead of every, every application or a need for this lookups, the operating system usually has this built in, so we can help with that. You can build one your own. It's not that difficult. Uh, we have also a great tool that's available in both Linux, Windows, and uh, OS X called NSLOOKUP. And that's a great tool for troubleshooting and for looking up stuff. So I will encourage you to, to learn that command. And I will show that in the demos, hopefully tomorrow, uh, how to use that command. Uh, We can ask two different kind of queries uh, when we ask the DNS server for something. We can ask, ask a recursive query. And then we, we tell our DNS server, which we are contacting, that we want the complete answer here. And if you can't give me the complete answer, if it doesn't exist or something like that, you can't find it, I want you to give me an error message that you didn't find it. This is the general use by a DNS client who are contacting a DNS server, not server-to-server -server communication. Uh, and that's because we don't want the root servers to, we won't, don't want the DNS server to contact and, and root server and tell me, give me the full address for this domain. Then it will have a lot more work, work to do. Uh, can be a DNS server if we have configured it with the forwarder. But we won't use a forwarder to the root servers. We usually make a forward, if we have an internal DNS server, server uh, name server, and that won't know a lot of the names on the internet. It will only know the internal names. Uh, but all our clients are uh, connected to that name server, and they want to know stuff about the internet. So then we will make a forward probably to the DNS server supplied by our ISP, our internet provider. And that's OK with it. So that can be uh, a recursive query. Then we have the iterative, or non-recursive, it also can be called. Here, the, the client part allows the DNS server just to return the best answer it can give without having to forward and ask new servers. So it will look into its cache if it has this. If it doesn't, it will, will provide the best it can. And if it has no cache at all, it will probably uh, return uh, one of the root servers. Okay, I don't know this one, but you can still ask one of the root servers. Or maybe it was an uh, .com address, and it had cache for the name service for the .com, it will supply that one. Uh, then the client can take that answer and make another iterative query to that uh, referral as it got. We usually call this walking the tree because it starts up high and then walks slowly down to the, to the correct answer. Uh, and usually, server-to-server -server communication is like this. So the DNS server that I'm closer to me will do the work for me. It won't ask the other servers up the chain to make work for them. Uh, so just for an example here, if I wanted, let's say, the address for a web server, www cs.lnu.se. Here I have a client. He will ask, he has a configured name server uh, in his IP settings. So he will ask a uh, recursive question to the, his name server. I want the best answer you can, I, I want the complete answer or an error. His name server will make an iterative answer if it doesn't have the answer before. It will start looking in his zone files. If uh, it's not part of his zones, 
then he will look in his cache. If it's an empty cache, uh, it will go on to the forwarder. If it doesn't have a, a forwarder, it will ask the root hints. Okay, give me a, a root server. So it will ask an iterative question about the full domain name, the www.cs.lnu.se. And since it's an iterative question, it will only uh, reply with the name server information for the dot, uh, .se address, name servers. So it will get that back. He will store this information according to the time to live in his cache. So now he has the information about the SE name servers. Then he will continue and ask the .se server. Do you know the, the full address? It will probably just tell you, I have a delegation to lnu.se name servers. So it will get all the name servers for that domain. And as you can imagine, he will continue making iterative questions uh, and in the LNU uh, domain, they have uh, make a delegation also to a uh, department. So it will give its best answer. And finally, it will connect to the uh, name server at uh, cs.lnu.se and get the record. Because under here, we have a record or connected to, to that one. And during all these parts, uh, he will cache this information. So our client will get back the full answer for this one. If another client will ask the question about, let's say, it, uh, www.it.lnu.se. It will make a recursive question, and the server will look in its own file. You won't find anything there. Then it look in cache. OK, I don't know the www.it. I know the address for LNU. So it will ask that server, OK, do you have this information? It will say no, but we have delegated control to the IT. And then it will contact the IT and get the answer. Uh, and this time to live, the cache, will be counting down. So if, if for this server, maybe time to live was one day, or maybe 30 days, because the SC name servers doesn't change that much. It shouldn't uh, be. Then it will store the cache for that period of time. So you probably see that the time to live will be lower the farther down you come in the, the tree. Um, but you might know that, okay, our department, we are making a lot of changes next week. We are changing all of our IP addresses and we are getting a lot of new servers. A good thing then would be to lower the TTL a week before or something like that to very low number. So when we make all the changes, the, t the time to live on all the cache servers will be expired. So a good thing is that when you know, OK, I have my system up and running. Uh, I don't plan to make any big changes in quite some time. Then you can make the, uh, increase the, the time to live on all your records. But then maybe you uh, realize, OK, we need, need to make some changes this weekend. Then we lower it. So you have to think about that when you're planning for, for big changes. OK. Um, now to the use cases of DNS, it differs a bit. Uh, we have the public, which is the part that we have been talking a lot of uh, this first half of the lecture. Uh, and if you want <coughs> resources, uh, servers, or uh, services to be ac uh, accessible from the outside of your network, uh, you will need uh, to set up this uh, public DNS servers. And what you do then, you will set up a name server. Uh, it has to be in some network that is accessible from the outside, from the internet. 
you will configure the zone file for the domain that you are planning to use. Then you will contact some uh, register or reseller of domain names and purchase that domain. Uh, they will ask you during that process, what is your name servers? So they can make a delegation. Um, <coughs> then you have to supply the, the information, these publicly accessible IP addresses for your name servers. Uh, usually they require that you have at least two. Um, and when this is done, uh, you can add your resource records uh, in your name server and they will be uh, able to be looked up from clients all over the internet. Uh, so you can make any changes you will wish under your domain. When it comes to, to internal or private DNS, uh, there isn't anything uh, making you not use uh, already uh, used uh, TDL, TLD, top level domain. So you could, on your internal uh, server, name server, configure name fi a zone file for google.se. And then you could put records in that zone. And every computer are, that are, have been configured to use your DNS server will trust the records it will give. So when you try to go to www.google.com, your internal server can give an address for a totally different web server or not hosted by Google. And of course, uh, that's why it's not recommended that we use uh, top level domains with the internal names because we can get some uh, nasty <laughs> troubles. Uh, but you should also realize that when you are connecting to a network with your computer, uh, it could be a public uh, network, you will get, you will get a, an IP address from an, a DSCP server, and with that lease, you will also get the information for which DNS server you should use. And usually that is a server run by that uh, the one who gave you the IP address. And he or she can actually point you to anywhere you, you don't want to be. Uh, so you have to realize that the DNS by itself is not a secure system. Uh, you can't, you have to really trust the name service that you are using. Um, so the recommended thing to do if you want to have, if you want the DNS to easily manage our internal network. We have a lot of file servers and printers and uh, clients that we want to use names uh, instead of IP addresses for. Uh, then we don't want these to have maybe public IP addresses or be, uh, be able to look up outside the network. Then we need a way to have internal uh, zone. And I have seen a lot of different ways to do this. Uh, some take their comp, uh, the name, if we say LNU, and that um, use the, the top level domain local or internal or something like that. So you have LNU.local, and then it always should be the zone for the internal. But that's not recommended uh, also because the, the RFC are about this uh, state that every name should be globally unique. And if you use a technique when you use a, a t TLD that is local or something, then probably another company will do the same, uh, to have a similar name or, or short uh, name for their company. So names can actually be the same. It won't be accessible from the different uh, computers, but it's not good. So what I've collected is they recommend is that you use your public domain. Um, let's say lnu.se. But for the internal, you make a subdomain. So maybe you have 
corp.lnu.se for corporate or for internal or local.lnu.se. And then you delegate the control to an internal server. Or you don't make the delegation at all because then you will show outside that we have this local and maybe you don't want that. You just set up the servers internally and make a zone file for local.lnu.se. And every computer inside your network that are relying on that domain will get answers for the internal systems. But if they want to go outside, maybe go to google.com, it will probably have a forwarder for an outside DNS server. Maybe the company's uh, internet provider's name server. OK, that's it for DNS. Now we will, during the demos, go through DNS more in detail. Uh, tomorrow, probably won't install some DNS service. We'll just talk about and show you how to use NS Lookup and stuff like that to realize uh, how DNS works. Uh, but the second topic of today is DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. Uh, and that is for helping IT administrators manage IP addresses. So I've shown you last time that you can set static addresses for your machines. And that's good for if you have a very small company. But if you have more than, let's say, five to ten machines, it will be quite difficult to manage this. You will get conflicts. You will forget what you put for IP for one server and put the same IP on another and the network won't work as you, it's supposed to. So it can help with uh, IP address conflicts if you implement a DHCP, which is a server. Um, when the, a client or an interface comes into the network, it will check is there an DHCP server if it's configured that way. And the DHCP server will, OK, here's an address for you. And it will check that off of the list. And then it won't give that out until the lease time is out. Um, but the computer has to be configured to use, or the client has to be configured to use DHCP. Still, if you assign a static address of, for one machine, the DHCP server can also assign that same IP address because it doesn't know that it's already be, been taken by one machine. So it doesn't have a, a system to look up if the IP address has already been used. We have some terminology in the DHCP department also. A scope is the, the range of addresses that you want to be included. Uh, in your DHCP server, addresses that it could hand out to clients and other servers. Then we have something called exclusion range. Uh, it can be that you want the first 10 addresses and the uh, middle 15 should be reserved for some systems. Then you can exclude them from the scope. And when you exclude those from the scope, that is your address pool. That is the available addresses for uh, the DNS server. And when it's hand out uh, an IP address for a client or a server, that is called a lease. Uh, you can also make reservations. So these, this server over here always get the same address. It doesn't get handed out or leased to another computer. And that's because for, for, for servers, if you have a, put a DNS record for the server, file server.lnu.se, you want the, the same IP address for it to stay the same. So then you will register a reservation for that file server. So the initialization process for the lease uh, looks like this. Since the, the, the client, it doesn't have to be a, a, 
a client, it can be a, the client can be a server. It doesn't have to be a desktop or something like that. It can be a uh, phone or anything that has an interface, uh, network interface. It will then make a broadcast. Uh, as you see, the destination address is the uh, the broadcast address, and it has an IP address of 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0. If we have a DHCP server, it will, okay, get these broadcasts, and then it will, okay, here we have a DHCP offer, if you're interested. Then the client will pick that up and make a request. Okay, I want to take this address. Is that okay? The DHCP server then acknowledged that and put that in his record, that this client has not this IP address. It also has a lease time with that lease. So you can configure it to, uh, you can have this address for, let's say, four hours. After the four hours is gone, the DHCP server will delete that offer so it's publicly available for new leases. But hopefully if the DHCP client is still in the network, Sometime before the lease go out, it will ask, can I still keep this address? Okay, you can. And then it will update the, the you can say time to live. So these are some words that you might have seen if you analyze traffic with the Wireshark or something like that. You can see this DHCP discover, offer, request, and acknowledgement. So there are some things to consider when you set up a DCP. You should have at least one scope uh, in the DCP. You can have several scope. A server can have different scope, different addresses. Um, it needs to have different, if you have different subnets, you have to connect them so the DCP server has to have different interfaces. But it can still, the server itself can offer different scope and networks, but it has to have an, an endpoint to each of these subnets to be able to uh, release addresses for that subnet. Uh, you should exclude static IP addresses. Probably you won't use DHCP for servers that ha will, you want to have the same addresses for. You can use DHCP, but then you should make reservations uh, so they don't get the addresses doesn't get handed out to uh, the wrong clients. Uh, you also don't have a, anything called load balancing or a failover when can it, when it comes to DNS, uh, DHCP. Sorry. Uh, so if the DHCP server goes down, then the addresses won't be able, available uh, for leases. You can't have a, a server, you can't have two servers who are offering the same addresses because then they don't, they don't talk to each other so they don't know which addresses have been leased out and which hasn't. So then they probably will lease out the same addresses for different computers. There are some systems to, to make this work so they communicate, but the standard DHCP server doesn't have this included. In Windows, you have this failover system that if it detects that one DHCP server goes down, it can bring up another computer, but they are not actively uh, active at the same time. Uh, after you created a scope, you can make changes to it. You can make new reservations and uh, adjust the length of the lease time and stuff like that. You probably have if you have a, a, a Wi-Fi set up, uh, you probably would have a shorter lease time for that scope because the client come and go more frequently in, than they do in the have, if they have a, a wired connection. Uh, in some, some systems, you can make the DHCP server interact with the DNS server. And this looks good on paper, but I wouldn't recommend it. I will come to that. But what it does is 
when the client contact make the IP request, it gets the the, the lease acknowledgement. Uh, the DNS DHCP server will contact the DNS server and update the point record that connects the IP address to the name. And the client will contact the DNS server and update the, the host name. And that would look really great because then our, uh, me as an administrator doesn't have to update the DNS manually for all the clients who are connected. But there are no security or authentication involved in this process, which make it quite easy for uh, if we get a, a computer into the system, uh, it can tell me, okay, I want to, to update the DNS with, with my name. So he can say that he's the web server or the uh, file server or something like that. You know, also, it's a, a way for, if you have older o operating systems or not compliant, the, the client part isn't compliant, then the D DHCP server can both update the DNS record and uh, uh, the point record and the A record. But I wouldn't recommend using this uh, for obvious reasons. In a Windows environment, if you have an Active Directory, then you can have, uh, you ha will have authentication built in. But that's not a part of the uh, DNS and the DHCP uh, protocols. That is a, something on, on top of that. But we will talk more about that uh, uh, when we talk about Active Directory. So I wouldn't recommend uh, integrating the DHCP with the DNS, even if it sounds great for an administrator's, uh, administrator's point. So, uh, some takeaways. DNS is really important for the internet to work properly. Uh, you wouldn't be able to do almost anything. You can't send email, you can't go to web page, you can't use web services, you can't watch TV or something like that over the internet without DNS. So it's really important. And it's quite a good system uh, when it comes to uh, reliability. It's almost never, if, if something's wrong, it's probably not the, the DNS, if it's properly set up. You can have, uh, well, if, if there is a problem, probably you have uh, made new updates uh, or a server has changed the IP and you have a long, too long uh, time to live and it will take that amount of time before clients can, can get to that service again. Uh, the DNS zone should not be, it's not the same as a domain. It's good. Troubleshooting DNS can be hard because of caching. You can think you can you can flush the the, the, the cache on your computer and e even on your DNS server, but you can control the the name servers in between. So it can be hard to to uh, to troubleshoot if you have a problem. But I will show you some techniques uh, in the demos. And you don't solve the the IP address conflicts with DHCP. Uh, it can help, but any client. Uh, who has the, the right to change his IP settings could just take one address, even if it's just even if it's uh, already been used by another DHCP client. Uh, 